Well, he finally did it. Terry Smith, he's the British guy, one of my favorite investors. He's one that invests in high quality companies and owns them for a long period of time. His equity fund, Fundsmith, has beat the market for the past 12 years. This Terry Smith finally purchased Apple. In the portfolio commentary for October of 2022, they say that we purchased a stake in Otis and we begin a currently small holding in Apple. Terry Smith finally purchased his first share in Apple. Now, obviously I find this exciting because I've owned Apple for a long time. In fact, it's my largest holding right now. It's my biggest bet, my biggest conviction. I'm in the green on this company by a wide margin. And the things that I see in this company are something that I've hoped Terry Smith would see for a while. Now there's nothing special or unique about buying Apple stock, but the interesting thing about this purchase is that just as recent as two years ago, Terry spoke negatively about Apple. He had major concerns about it. He actually compared it to Nokia. So what happened? Why did he go from comparing it to Nokia to now purchasing it? We're gonna discuss the answers in this episode. Now, of course, we also have the headline news that the Federal Reserve approved another 75 basis point hike. That was to be expected. But what investors are really looking for is any indication whatsoever that there's going to be a slowdown in raising rates. And right off the bat, the Fed is giving hints of a change in policy ahead. We're going to look at what those hints are and what they mean for investors. So as always, we have a lot of news to get to in this episode, a lot of exciting things to cover. Now, just as a reminder, this episode is sponsored by the Joseph Carlson Show Patreon. You get access to the Qualtrum suite of software that has fundamental data on every company. We're continually iterating and adding more and more to this software. It has a tool called the Dip Finder, which shows you visually which companies of yours are in a dip or in a price surge. It has graphs and pages dedicated to showing you visually your income growth and dividends. So if you're a dividend growth investor, you can track this month by month. All of the software is included, plus hour-long exclusive episodes and a Discord community with over 2,400 members strong. If you haven't tried this out, give it a shot. The best thing is it's completely risk-free. You can try it out with a free trial using the link in the description below. All right, now let's go ahead and jump right in with my portfolio. This is the passive income portfolio with a goal of growing defensive passive income through dividends by investing in high quality compounding companies. That sounds pretty complicated, but it's really simple when you break it down. I buy good companies and try to hold on to them as long as they remain good companies. One of my top holdings in my portfolio, in fact, my biggest one right now is Apple. I have an oversized position in Apple. I have around 16% of the portfolio in this one company. Right now, the position size is 51,000, and I currently have $15,700 in gains. This is a company that I've been bullish on for years and years now. In fact, I started buying Apple way back in 2018. I've been a fan of the company for a very long period of time. So needless to say, I was excited when I saw that Terry Smith, an investor that I've come to admire a lot, an investor that invests in high quality companies, finally decided to buy Apple. But this was somewhat of a surprising thing to see for many because Terry Smith just as recent as two years ago, spoke negatively about Apple. He actually went in depth and explained why he's not buying the company. In fact, this interview here is from April 7th, 2020, and Terry Smith has a breakdown with charts and graphs explaining why he's not currently purchasing Apple. I wanna go ahead and observe his arguments just two years ago of why he wasn't buying this company, and then give explanation of what I believe has changed since then. Jules, do you wanna do Apple? Uh, yeah. So, so the point of this, uh, I, I think one thing to preface the, this slide with is to say the, the reason we don't own Apple is not because we think Apple's a poor company, it's because if Fundsmith fails, and, 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 and you know, God, I hope it doesn't, um, the reason will be because we, we pick companies which we're not particularly sure of, uh, but they happen to be very fashionable at the time. And if you look at the, uh, if you look at um, Apple's uh, returns going back, so you'll start with 1977 to 1985 when Steve Jobs uh, first uh, invented the company, um, and obviously things went pretty well. Uh, and then you'll see that uh, when he uh, when he was fired and he left the company, uh, things obviously went fairly uh, not apple shaped but pear shaped. Um, and then uh, when he came back, uh, things uh, went extremely well. And then uh, after he passed away, um, obviously uh, they had more of a product at this stage, but things haven't gone nearly as well. So Fundsmith throws up these four different charts here, and it paints a bit of a timeline which highlights their concern. The basic premise of this is when Steve Jobs is running Apple, 
things are going well. When he steps away, things don't go so well. And they use these net income charts to illustrate that. From 1977 to 1985, Steve Jobs was running the company, and you can see the net income going up over time. Then from 1986 to 1997, the time period where Steve Jobs was not running the company, the net income basically stagnates and then even goes flat. Then Steve Jobs returns, 1998 to 2011, the net income explodes, the company has massive growth, and then from 2012 to 2019, without Steve Jobs because he's dead, Apple's net income starts to stagnate. So there's the narrative that Terry Smith is working with. And under this assumption that Apple's only a good company with this brilliant founder, I can actually see why Terry Smith wouldn't want to own the company. If this is the premise you're playing off of, I wouldn't want to own the company either. Now, obviously, this is an argument that I've heard many times when investing in Apple, that Apple is no longer innovative, that they don't do much after Steve Jobs, that the company's basically stagnant and they just come out with a little iPhone change year after year. These are arguments that I do not agree with. I didn't agree with Terry Smith's arguments when he made them back in 2020. And obviously something has changed with Terry Smith as well. But let's continue on with them and their original concern here. You'll see that, um, I mean, one of the things that I think we've, we've mentioned this in one of these meetings in the past is that if you actually were to, if, if you listen to the reports of Apple's results, all you ever hear is about iPhone sales or iPad sales or latterly wearable sales or services sales. Um, but in fact, um, last year sales actually fell slightly and cash flows have actually been um, static for a while now. But in the meantime, the shares have obviously trebled. Okay, so they share another chart here that's also a bit alarming. From 2015 to 2019, Fundsmith is highlighting that Apple's sales really didn't grow all that much. It's barely up a couple percentage points. And then the cash flows from operations are also stagnating. But during that time period, the price for Apple went up triple. Now again, given this time period, I think this is a reasonable argument from Fundsmith. I could see why they'd be hesitant to buy a company that has revenues and operating incomes basically being flat, but the stock price is going up. I again disagree with it, and I did at this time period. I thought there's a lot going on with Apple beyond just the numbers, and I'll explain that a little bit later. But I want to continue listening to the other arguments they make against Apple. Um, so uh, it's not that we think it's a poor business, it's just that we have seen companies like this in the past. Uh, in our old business, um, we used to go in with, with our old uh, financial model uh, called Quest and tell people that Nokia, whose share price was 65, was worth 12. Um, and we turned out to be wrong because it turned out to be worth three four. or four. Um, and people uh, used to go on about... You're too bullish. People used to go on about their ecosystem and nothing would ever break this up. So things like that just make us a little uncertain. Yeah, I mean... So there they mentioned Nokia and the comparisons of Nokia's ecosystem to people talking about Apple's ecosystem now. And then even after all of this, Terry Smith goes on to give an additional concern about Apple, which is that it's a fashion business and it's kind of trendy. One of the things that, that scares us is fashion businesses. Fashion businesses always need a guiding genius. And when the guiding genius is no longer there or just loses interest in the subject, they don't do very well. Um, if I were to put up fashion businesses from the past and you looked at them and they'd done very well, if I put up FC UK or something like that, you would find a pattern that looks like that, basically. Guiding genius there, great. Guiding genius no longer there or no longer attentive, that's what you get. And, and it, it just feels a bit like that's the pattern, that actually what we've got here is something that produces cool things with curved corners. Right? And, and it's a bit fashionable and, and it's kind of... Is it got the guiding genius to do the next really cool thing that is going to capture things? I'm not too sure looking at that. So there he describes Apple as a fashion business, a company with a genius leader that creates cool things with smooth corners. So there we have some strong arguments, a lot of really good arguments with data and foundation against buying Apple. Now here's where I have disagreed with Terry Smith and where I think he ultimately will come to explain where he's been wrong on Apple. First of all, I've thought that Terry Smith would buy Apple eventually for some time now. And this is a prediction that I've made over and over again. I've had Discord members ask me specifically about this. What do you think about Terry's take on Apple? Linking to this video. I said, 
Apple's cash flow has about doubled since that video. And this was just last month. I said, I don't understand the comments about it doing poorly since Steve Jobs. I don't know why he doesn't own it. It has long-term high returns on capital employed, a lower PE than most of his companies. I think he'll eventually buy similar to Amazon. Now that that prediction has come true and he finally bought his first share of Apple, I wanna explain where I think that these original arguments were wrong. First of all, these charts showing that Apple only does really well during Steve Jobs' tenure are simply incorrect. Of course, the data here is real, but I think it leaves out a lot of other data that's important. Jobs died in October of 2011. From 2012 to 2019, Apple's revenue grew at a steady pace, consistently, almost every single year, not even counting the most recent years where the revenue exploded to the upside. The free cash flow also grew over that time period. In fact, it grew at a pretty steady pace. The net income is very similar to the free cash flow. It grew over time from 2011 to 2019. But even outside of the raw numbers, the whole idea that Apple hasn't innovated or progressed as a company outside of Steve Jobs' tenure is simply incorrect. Apple has came out with the AirPods, one of their best selling devices ever. That was almost an instant mega hit. They came out with the Apple Watch, which is their entrance into healthcare. They came out with their own M1 chip, advanced internal chip design, pushing out Intel. And they've created over six different services with over 900 million subscriptions sold. This company has pushed forward in multiple directions on multiple fronts, making a lot of progress after Steve Jobs' death. So this first argument showing that Apple only does well under Steve Jobs, I simply think is wrong. And I think the past 10 years has objectively proven this wrong. Now for this next chart, Apple's share price going up while the sales and cash flows remain the same. I think this is unfortunate timing from Fundsmith and from Terry Smith, because if you look at the chart here, it covers the years from 2015 to 2019. To illustrate how bad the timing is of this chart, here's the years that this chart actually outlined, 2015 to 2019. The earnings were growing during that time period, but not substantially. Then we get into 2020 and 2021, and they go up nearly double. So I think a lot of the problem with this chart is hindsight bias. We look at Apple now and we know that the past two years have been incredibly good for the company. Their earnings have shot up, their cash flows have shot up, and their product line has done exceptionally well. This is obviously beyond Fundsmith's expectations. Now the next part that I'll respond to is Terry Smith referring to Apple as a fashion business. And one of the things that, that scares us is fashion businesses. I think that Apple devices do have some fashion appeal. I think the brand and the loyalty and the device design is very important. It is a design company, but I view Apple again, the same way that I have for years, a company that's more akin to a consumer staple. It is something that people don't have just because they have the Apple logo. In fact, many times people put cases on their devices. They protect them. They don't even show off the device itself. They want the device to be with them at all times because a company is not a discretionary company. It is an essential company. I don't know many people that can forget to leave the home without their iPhone and go through their day without the phone. That is something incredibly rare. Most people need their devices by their side all the time. And in terms of the comparisons to Nokia, I also thought this was a very weak argument. Nokia has never had anywhere close to the same ecosystem Apple has now. They didn't have iMessage or the Apple Watch or the Apple AirPods or the Apple TV. They didn't have six different services with hundreds of millions of subscribers to them. Nokia never got even close to this level. Nokia was simply a phone seller, which I think is substantially different than Apple is now. So of course I disagreed with a lot of these arguments about Apple, even at the time they were given, but I don't hold it against Terry Smith. In fact, going back and looking at someone that once had a case against a company and then has decided to change his mind on that company, I think is a good trait for investors. I think this is an example of an investor being open-minded, willing to admit that they got something wrong and changing their thesis. And Terry Smith remains an investor that I think is very open-minded. In this interview, listen to how many times he says he may be wrong on Apple. What scares me with Apple is uh, that I lived through the rise and fall of Nokia. And, uh, and I heard all the same reasons why we shouldn't worry about a consumer electronics business uh, reverting to mean returns because it was, quote, an ecosystem. And maybe it is, maybe I'm wrong, but it does worry me uh, that this is a business which is, seems to be driven, at least in part, by the need to continue to churn out the next uh, nice flat device with rounded corners uh, that you want to buy, even though it's the same as the last one, roughly speaking. It worries me. And it worries me particularly if you ever get to the day when you don't have a guiding uh, single mind at the top of the organization. 
But I might be wrong. I mean, bear in mind with all this, I might be wrong. Is it too late? Probably not. In that 30 second clip on Apple, Terry Smith mentions that he may be wrong three different times. That's how open-minded he is. So I'm happy to see Terry Smith finally add Apple to the portfolio. My prediction is he'll continue to add to this position over time, and it will grow from a small position into a larger position. So we'll see how this goes over time, but that's the update so far. Now, moving on, we have the Fed raising interest rates another 75 basis points. This is the headline news of the day. It's what's driving all the markets right now. Interest rates going up, causing stocks to go down. Now, so far, if we just look at the reaction of the market, which is very volatile right after these meetings, everything's in the red across the board. The Nasdaq's down almost 2%. So it doesn't look positive so far, but this headline here makes it look kind of positive. When I read this headline, it says that the Fed is hinting at a change in policy ahead. In my opinion, this headline is a bit misleading. Everything that I've read and seen about this meeting in particular has been overwhelmingly negative. That's my takeaway. In fact, out of all the exchanges, out of everything said during this entire press conference from Jay Powell to all these different reporters, this was by far, I think, the worst of the exchange. This is where Jay Powell basically gave the doom and gloom signal that we're going into a recession. Because we haven't seen um, inflation coming down, the, impl if, if the implication of inflation not coming down. And what we, what we would expect by now to have seen is that as the, really as the supply side problems had, had resolved themselves, we would have expected goods inflation to come down by now, long since by now. And it really hasn't, although it's, it's it, actually it has come down, but it's it, not to the extent we had hoped. At the same time, now you see services inflation, core services inflation moving up. And, um, I, I just think that, that the inflation picture has become more and more challenging over the course of this year, without question. That's just the first part of this little exchange. Inflation, their major objective, the whole reason that they're slowing down everything, tightening policy, everything they're trying to accomplish, he frankly says it's not working. It's just not working. Inflation isn't coming down. It's just transitioning from some goods to services. So the goal and the objective is not being accomplished. And he doesn't make a lot of mention about a whole lot of progress. Investors are waiting for him to say, we're making a lot of progress on this front. We got to keep going a little bit, but we're, we're almost there. But that's not what the Fed is saying. And then he continues to go on even further than this with more bad news, saying that the path of a soft landing, having a soft landing, meaning that the economy doesn't go into recession, that path has narrowed. That means that we have to uh, have policy be more restrictive. And that narrows the path to a soft landing, I would say. Thanks very much. And that's where he ends the meeting. Yeah, by the way, we're not tackling inflation. We're not making progress on our goal. And we're likely to go into recession. But I got a lunch to catch, so I got to see you later. So I think these headlines here of hints of smaller hikes, something that normally would be positive, I didn't get a positive vibe from this meeting. I didn't see really any progress being made. What I see is a Fed that's in a tough position. They've raised rates aggressively for a long period of time and they're not accomplishing their goal. So they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. And they're now conceding that there's a high likelihood of a recession. They're saying that openly. Now, what does this mean for our portfolios and investments? I think there's gonna be some temporary headaches. The market obviously doesn't like this. Every major indice is plummeting further and further into the red by the minute. And that's something that we should expect. And overall, I think if you're investing right now, Looking at your investments through the lens of hoping for a Fed pivot, in my opinion, is not a valid investment strategy. I think you should be making your investments in quality companies at good valuations and holding on to them for the next 10 years. If what the interest rates do in the short term has the biggest impact on your investment decisions, I simply think you have too short of a timeline. So for me, even given this news, it doesn't change much with my investment strategy at all. Now that's going to be it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed watching and I'll see you in the next one.